Okay, Mayur and your team, the chairpersons, thank you very much for inviting me. Slightly provocative topic. And I'm going to say things which have really bothered me over the last few many years. And I won't go into many details, but I'm really proud that mine is the only diabetes unit in the world where the logo is mother and baby. And this has been even before I met David Barker because of my interest in gestational diabetes. Recently, I read this interesting book, The Elephant in the Womb. And I thought that was great because that's what we are really talking about. So evolution of the concept really started with NDDG meeting in 1979. And uh, they actually took into notice all the Sullivan and Oman data, which said that pregnancy glycemia associated with later diabetes. But later on, the same group said that actually that can also affect the pregnancy outcomes. And therefore, it's a different entity than just being a precursor to future diabetes. A lot of physiology was tested then, and people described that insulin resistance in the mother was high at 24 to 28 weeks. And therefore, that was the time decided for doing a glucose testing. As time went by, people described both short-term and long-term outcomes in the condition, both in the mother and the baby, which we all know about. However, many times people have described correct points or criteria without any outcomes in consideration, like WHO did in 1985 and 1999. They just took non-pregnant IGT as gestational diabetes. Subsequently, the Chicago group and collaborators across the world did the HAPO study, developed the IADPSG criteria, which WHO and ADA have now accepted, and the outcomes are based on macrosomia, as we will see. And finally, the very interesting questions are, are the outcomes preventable or not preventable? And is there genetic or epigenetic issues involved in this? So this is what Norbert Frankel from Chicago proposed as a problem in the diabetic pregnancy, fuel-mediated teratogenesis. And this word is very similar to what David Barker described as programming. So now, but Frankel said, we know of teratogenesis as abnormalities of development, but even large size birth and abnormalities later in life are part of teratogenesis. And that is how he put his fuel mediated teratogenesis idea. In the same oration, he also drew this figure where he distinguished between pre-gestational and gestational diabetes, saying that gestational diabetes is largely a third trimester phenomenon. And I'm going to challenge this concept. So I wrote an editorial in Diabetes Care in 2010. They invited me to write about fetal programming of diabetes. It's quite an interesting and big editorial. I've just chosen some points here. Do we really know what glucose levels are good or bad in pregnancy for mother or baby? Then we diagnose so-called gestational diabetes in pregnancy and think that it goes away. And we think it wasn't there before. But is it really a de novo diabetes of pregnancy? If there is an element of pre-gestational problem there, then to diagnose so-called gestational diabetes in pregnancy is then too late because the periconceptional programming which determines the non-communicable risk for the baby is already over. And finally, we are going to see who benefits from treating GDM, mother, baby, in short and long term. And by treating GDM, we always hope that we are going to prevent the diabetes pandemic in the young children and the next generation 
do we have any evidence for that? So do we really know what is diabetes in pregnancy? And diabetes usually in our mind is a yes or no thing. There is a cut point. Now, HAPO's study showed beautifully that the association between maternal glucose and the outcomes which they measured, which is large baby, caesarean section, neonatal hypoglycemia, or the 90th centile are all continuous and monotonic, both for the fasting glucose and two-hour glucose and also for one-hour glucose. So there is a continuous association. There was no indication at all that there is something called diabetes, which is different than the normal distribution. So there was no threshold. The current criteria are based on HAPO and they are based on outcomes which are largely related to large baby and the problems it faces like caesarean section or IC peptide in the cord blood. And ultimately, a statistical committee sat and arbitrated about the criteria. So what we use today are statistical arbitration. In last two years, three years, three trials have been published. There has been a trial for a randomized clinical trial of gestational diabetes screening by the one-step approach, which is doing the 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test as the first investigation, or the classic thing that you first do a glucose wow. challenge test with 50 grams, wow. and then only wow. in a limited number, you do a 100 gram oral glucose tolerance test. In this study, we will see what they found. So here they are doing one step against two step comparison. Recently, Caroline Crowther published from New, uh, from New Zealand two criteria for gestational diabetes. One are the IPSG criteria, which are much more like say intensive and lower level versus the ADIP, uh, the ADIPS criteria, which are used in New Zealand and the Australasian countries. So 99 and 162. So low versus high glucose. And the third trial was early gestational screening versus routine gestational screening, which is before 20 weeks and after 20 weeks. What did these three randomized trials show us? In the one-step versus two-step, whether you diagnosed by one-step a larger number of diabetes, which was almost three times higher than the two-step, the, in the two separate arms of this trial, there was no difference in the LSES delivery prevalence, preeclampsia in the mother, yeah. No difference in LGA, SGA, preterm birth or shoulder dystocia. Only thing which was higher in the one step was the neonatal hypoglycemia incidence. The composite outcomes were similar in the two. In the Crowther trial, lower versus higher glucose, LSCS similar, preeclampsia similar, but the health service use was much more in the lower than the upper one. That means women were visiting this health services many times. The cost of pregnancy was much higher and the neonatal hypoglycemia was also higher. So all other neonatal outcomes were similar. In the early versus routine screening, no difference in any of these measurements in the two groups. In other words, whether you do one step or two step, lower or higher glycemia criteria, or early or routine screening, whatever we do to the baby and the mother, to the mother and the baby, doesn't make any difference, except that in certain circumstances, there is a lot of hype around the condition and excess use of health services. So then second issue is, are we really dealing with a gestational abnormality? And now there is a new fad, I put it into inverted commas, 
that this 24 to 28 weeks is too late. So let us diagnose it before 20 weeks. So diagnosing it early. And we saw what was the result of that trial. There's also a controversy whether only glucose is responsible for the problem or non-glucose markers like lipids are also involved. We won't go much into that. So a whole lot of markers have been described which can be measured in the first trimester and they vary right from RBP, that's retinol binding protein 4, SHBG, FABP4, adiponectin, rispatin, various miRNAs, various other protein molecules which claim to diagnose gestational diabetes in early pregnancy. It's quite interesting that glucose doesn't appear here which would be really very simple to measure and actually easily done in any laboratory. But I suppose there is a whole lot of industry around this. So what they are saying is women who had abnormal levels of these molecules were more likely to be diagnosed GDM between 24 and 28. That's developmental origins of health and disease. And this is an intergenerational and many times a transgenerational, that's more than two generation transmission. And this is predominantly environmental than genome and based on epigenomic changes which happen periconceptionally, which in turn affect fetal growth, development and differentiation. And David Barker picked up on low birth weight, but there are many other aspects. And then subsequent sort of epigenetic changes. What we are saying is the blueprint of the future is already decided very early in pregnancy. And are there any dohad markers for risk of gestational diabetes? Low birth weight is a strong risk factor for gestational diabetes. Being short is a risk factor for gestational diabetes and being short rises out of poor intrauterine linear growth as well as poor pubertal growth. So in other words, what we are saying is woman who is destined to become gestational diabetic already had intrauterine problems, already had pubertal and early life growth, linear growth problems. And in a study which was published from the Kaiser Permanente, they had these many thousand women who were diagnosed as gestational diabetes in their clinic. And many hundred of them had visited them for a whole body checkup many years before. And what they found was woman who was diagnosed as GDM was like old. She had a higher family history of diabetes. Her BMI was higher 10 years before pregnancy. Her glucose was higher. Her cholesterol was higher. Her insulin resistance was higher. And everything was actually suggestive of metabolic syndrome. In other words, though she was diagnosed as GDM pregnancy, she had all the normalities many, many years before. I developed this Pune maternal nutrition study in six villages near Pune in 1993 with help and collaboration from David Barker and Caroline Fogg from Southampton. And we have now 24, 25 years follow-up and third generation is being born and we have serial data on body size, body composition, metabolic abnormalities, cardiovascular risk factor, neurocognitive markers, and very high follow-up rates. Therefore, we are able to talk of various things in a life course model, which not many departments in the world can do. We have also an extensive biobank from the beginning, which has many different biological samples in our biobank. At 18 years of age, in these village boys and girls who had an average BMI of 19, there was 29% prevalence of diabetes. 
it was twice as much in males compared to the females so roughly you can say 20% in females 40% in females like it was commented before ifg was relatively more common especially in boys igt relatively less common two girls had diabetes one of them had modi the other one we don't know what type it is lot of nutritional deficiencies i have shown for b12 almost half of the population was b12 deficient and if we look at these boys and girls who had pre diabetes at 18 years of age and compare them with those who were normal glucose tolerant at 18 years we can see that these pre diabetic boys and girls had higher glucose at 12 years of age higher glucose at 6 years of age their insulin concentrations were similar Therefore, those who were diagnosed as high glucose in pregnancy had higher glucose in childhood and early puberty. Like Kaiser Permanente study, I mean, this is of course a community-based prospective work. So we are on much stronger sort of footing. And if we look at predictive value of fasting glucose at six years and twelve years. higher fasting glucose at 6 years increased the risk of pre diabetes at 18 years three times and six times for 12 years so there is a strong prediction of pre diabetes at 18 years by fasting glucose at 6 and 12 years and additional risk factors for pre diabetes were short birth length and small head circumference and non overweight mother in other words mother with a relative undernutrition and poor fetal growth especially the linear growth on this background it was very interesting that pre diabetic children's mothers had higher fasting pregnancy glucose though by no means it was in gestational diabetes range it was higher of the normal so there was a double burden of malnutrition in utero related to poor linear growth but higher exposure to glucose within normal range from the maternal side and we also measured mirnas in childhood and uh, adolescence and we have found markers in mirnas which are predictive of glucose intolerance at 18 years of age suggesting epigenetic mechanisms are already at heart now the girls in the cohort are now getting married and we have data on approximately 200 pregnancies in the f1 generation and we have information on their and their cord blood and interesting thing is ki if we look at pregnancy glycemia in these f1 generation girls and divide them into higher quartile of fasting glucose versus the remaining three quartiles the fasting glucose divided by this higher glucose in pregnancy again tracks back to 18 years 12 years and 6 years of age in other words what we call high glucose in pregnancy was already there in childhood in early puberty and early adult age though their height was similar their bmi was marginally higher right from early age though it's very much in the underweight region in the early years but subsequently after pregnancy they continue to put on weight and this is how within a life course a double burden of malnutrition arises no difference in homa sensitivity and homa beta in early age but disposition index which is beta cell function in relation to prevailing insulin sensitivity was low right from 6 years in other words girls whom we would diagnose pre diabetes in pregnancy for gdm they had poor beta cell function right from childhood and it's very interesting that one of the epidemiologist from uk whom i respect because i trained there he had said in 
that gestational diabetes woman is a woman with glucose intolerance who is also temporarily pregnant and that's what actually we can now show in this prospective form so we of course have a lot of diabetes in the world now in the young people and gestational diabetes and you know india comes up as highly cut state everywhere so what are we really doing by diagnosing more and more of gestational diabetes either by one step or reducing criteria or doing it early aldis huxley actually quite sarcastically said medical science has made such tremendous progress that there is hardly a healthy human left and that's what i think we are moving towards so who benefits by diagnosing gadm and its treatment and this consider this as an audit of current the there are two major trials of conventional versus intensive treatment of gdm one ran by caroline crowe from adelaide that's called a coi trial that was published in 2005 and london's multi center us trial which was published i think in 2009 what did we find treatment of gdm intensively reduced pre eclampsia in the mother cesarean deliveries were almost similar induction labor was higher in a trial indicating probably a lower threshold on part of the doctor because they were told that woman has gestational diabetes for the child serious perinatal complications were reduced in a coi trial not in the landen trial sga was similar lga was reduced and macrosomia was reduced in other words three things which improved during pregnancy is one is in mothers there was reduction in preeclampsia and in the child there was reduction in the birth weight so the lga and macrosomic children were reduced there was approximately 200 grams reduction in the birth weight then these children have been followed up in a coi trial at the time of school enrollment and there was no protection from childhood obesity measured either as bmi or weight or bmi more than 85th percentile resoundingly no effect in landen trial in addition to body size and they also measured hypertension low hdl elevated triglycerides impaired fasting glucose and three measures of body size no difference in other words there was no benefit to the child against either diabetes that means diabetes risk and obesity adiposity and this i think is really worth thinking because people make big claims by saying that we will diagnose gdm and we will prevent the pandemic of diabetes in the next generation we have followed up 200 children born in my department over last many years in diabetic pregnancies what did we find and i uh, can assure you given my training in this we have treated all these pregnancies intensively though not in a uh, randomized trial for those who are more 10 year old time follow up average age 15 years there was 5% diabetes and 37% pre diabetes that means 42% of 15 year old children born in diabetic pregnancy were either diabetic or pre diabetic as opposed to 20% in those born in non diabetic pregnancies and for younger children where we measured only capillary blood it was much higher from as early as 2 years of age in other words whatever we are doing in our clinic is not in better outcomes for the children what might be the reason for this as i said i am a staunch dohad believer and i believe in periconceptional period as being the most important period in the life course where future risk is determined 
the processes which are involved in this are gametogenesis fertilization implantation embryogenesis and placentation and all of them are over within a period of 72 hours to one week since conception and this is a fantastic figure coming from cambridge about how dna methylation is completely wiped out in first 24 to 48 years it is a reestablished again wiped out and reestablished which is what determines the future race of various conditions louis walpert a noted embryologist from uk said it's not birth marriage or death but gastrulation which is truly the most important time in your life and that is somewhere here that is where the three germinal layers are laid down and their fate is determined we have done epigenetic studies in the cord blood and the young children and found very interesting epigenetic markers which are imprinted very early in pregnancy and which are associated with glucose intolerance and obesity in the children i am not telling you the markers just now because it's being published soon now what about indian scenario majority of pregnancies are unplanned so by the time they come to the doctor it's many weeks into pregnancy much 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 beyond the preconceptional period we know there is a high prevalence of pre diabetes in the young data from pune and the national a uh, report on the nutrition which was published in 2017 which showed amazingly high prevalence of pre diabetes in children between 5 to 10 years and in adolescents between 11 and 19 years gdm as diagnosed is a big burden once you diagnose it the medical thresholds are lowered costs are increased cesarean sections are increased investigations increase a whole lot of things start happening there is a substantial inequity in rural urban and socio economic classes for diagnosis and treatment of this condition the average national birth weight in india is 2.8 kg even nfhs 5 in nfhs 4 where data is now available low birth weight was still between 15 to 25% in different states in diabetes unit like where i am the offspring of diabetic mothers usually have 100 g extra weight than this lga in my department is less than 10% in fact actually only 4% sga is not uncommon and there are very few follow up studies and no rcts of gdm treatment in india so really we are looking at gdm like the story of seven blind men looking at the elephant and there is also this elephant in the womb which is asking us to do more studies and come up with answers many years ago babra korki wrote this piece in diabetes care saying have we got it all wrong for diabetes and i have a feeling that we need to investigate this for gdm lois javonvik the very noted name in diabetes pregnancy one of my mentors you can see here i was with her and i convinced her about sga in diabetes in pregnancy which she didn't believe till then So she wrote this piece in uh, New England uh, in uh, diabetes care, saying, "Never say never in medicine." And I'll read the last paragraph. She said, "I never imagined that the strategy to ignore maternal glucose in women who are carrying fetuses predisposed to intrauterine growth retardation, and thus allow maternal hyperglycemia to remain untreated, in order to encourage more accelerated fetal growth." would be added to this list pat catlano another of my mentor said that achieving optimal metabolic control before planned pregnancy may offer the best but not necessarily the easiest option to achieve a healthy pregnancy outcome in short and a long term so my take home messages for you will be a there is lot to learn 
we go to meetings and we think of various things and people very vehemently propose various things most of it can be challenged and needs to be tested we need to be sensitive to local situations and remember indian baby is 2.8 kg american babies are 3.6 kg and we are accepting all their advice without challenging anything diagnosing gdm in pregnancy is too late so i think the category of gdm is under threat preconceptional detection and correction of metabolic abnormalities is the only way to go and that means from clinic we have to go to the community that's where i end my talk very happy to take any questions and criticism thank you